Okay, Commissioner Ed Rothstein, it is uh, 2 p.m. or 2.02, and we have a handful of updates from our uh, directors, um, and uh, they will do their best to staying within the time limits provided, and uh, <clears throat> if not, they're going to hear the buzzer, which, Chris, you have the liberty of sharing. Um, but the first up is Mr. Deggett to talk about the Department of Recreation and Parks. I thought you were going to say to talk about anything other than rezoning. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it Recreation and Parks and not Parks and Recreation? Depends on the county. Okay, go ahead. I Thank you very much. I think Recreation and Parks is appropriate in that order. Just we have neighbors on either side <laughs> who do it differently so and and it wasn't always was it it has been here yes oh it hasn't been here always yes. okay yeah it wasn't all right now i'm cutting into my 15. okay so, so now you have 14 minutes and 15 <laughs> yeah, seconds that's right. yes, i was told it was a hard 15 so thank you i'm going to throw a lot of information at you pretty quickly uh certainly there's opportunities for questions and maybe the better opportunities are to drill down after the fact if there's things you'd like to follow up on but uh, appreciate your time this afternoon wanted to give you an overview of our department and how we operate uh, you know, the organizational structure in general terms we have administration which oversees the capital budget we also have a marketing position and I have an administrative assistant plus myself so there are four staff in administration we have 15 staff in the Bureau of Parks these are the major park facilities like Piney Run, Hoshua, and the Half Acre Firearms Facility. Uh, Bureau of Recreation, which is the programming side of the department, they work with the recreation councils. We also have community recreation programs with some paid contractors. There are seven staff within that area. Also, you notice on the side, we have a Recreation and Parks Advisory Board. Uh, this is a citizen board. They are appointed by the Board of Commissioners and provide some very valuable input to us uh, regarding priorities for the capital budget. Also, when we're looking at potential policy changes, this is a great board to use as a sounding board. Who we are, we have 26 full-time positions uh, within our department. We have just under 4,800 acres, and we have a wide variety of different amenities that are offered. Uh, obviously not as much as some of the larger counties, but at the same time, we have some very unique facilities in Carroll, such as a planetarium, an observatory, and also a public shooting range. There's a graphic showing all of our parks. Uh, they're listed by name. We have 30 county parks. Uh, the graphic shows the illustration of them, and, and as you look at that, you notice that the northwestern section of the county is lighter than the other areas and there's a couple reasons for that one is population the population's a little lower there and the other is we have a tremendous amount of ag preservation land out in that district which makes it very difficult to purchase land for parks <clears throat> there are two slightly shaded trees located there those are park sites that have not yet been developed so those will be coming soon mentioned earlier our major park facilities uh, Hat Baker Firearms Facility, Piney Run, Carroll County Sports Complex, and Hoshua, which also has Bear Branch Nature Center. What's different about these facilities, they have their own operating budget within the Recreation and Parks operating budget. They also have staff, whereas the community parks do not have staff specifically assigned to them. And there's also a higher service level because of that, and generally there are some sort of fees involved as well. Volunteer Recreation Councils, we have 12 Recreation Councils. There's over 8,000 volunteer jobs that are filled on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes we have people who just move on from one sport to the next as the seasons change. But uh, the decision making for those organizations, we delegate that down to the Recreation Councils. They have locally elected leadership. Uh, the way we like to describe it, is that there's certain rules and guidelines that they need to follow. We will give them the blueprint for the house, but when it comes time to paint the house or decorate the house, those are local decisions. We do not get involved to that degree. So it's definitely a mixture of county staff. We advise them, but also local decision-making. 
Uh, these programs raise and spend a tremendous amount of money, between four and five million dollars every year. And, and I think it's important to point that out for the people looking, watching at home. If they offer, for instance, a soccer program, they may charge $80 for the soccer program. It may cost the council $120 to actually provide it. So they are making up that difference through local business sponsorships or fundraisers. We've probably <clears throat> all had the kids selling candy bars come to our doors. Uh, it's to help make up that difference. But when they bring in that amount of money, they are also spending it in order to pro provide those programs. And those funds never come through the county. We never touch them. And then lastly, the programs, they use every county school, every public school, all 40 of them, uh, county parks, uh, municipal parks, private land. Uh, we joked if it's flat and green, somebody's probably using it. <laughs> because it's hard to find flat in Carroll County. I mean, it's hard to find flat in Carroll County, you're right. A uh, quick comparison to some neighboring counties, because we get a lot of people who have come to Carroll County from Howard or Baltimore County. And there are some similarities, but there's some big differences. I mentioned earlier, we have 26 full-time staff. Howard County has 220. So obviously they are able to operate some things differently than we do. Baltimore County typically has multiple full-time recreation and park staff who work with each rec council within that county. Uh, I worked at Baltimore County years ago. I was one of four full-time staff just for the community of Reisterstown. So big difference in staffing levels. Because of that, we have volunteers performing a lot of tasks here in Carroll that are performed by staff in other locations. Um, Jeff, yes. Baltimore County also, I assume it's still the same, they pay their volunteer coaches. Well, they aren't volunteer coaches. They pay them. I, I remember uh, the <coughs> Dundalk community those guys wanted to be volunteers they took all their pay the first year and bought a new wrestling mat mm. so they were getting paid also which shocked me and a lot of the field maintenance that is done in baltimore county uh, you've got high school age kids who are lining fields babysitting the games while they occur that is all done by volunteers here in carroll uh, community recreation programs is also within the bureau of recreation and this was an initiative that was started in 1995. And what we've noticed over the years, for the most part, the recreation councils are very, very strong in youth sports. And some of them tended to be less strong when you look at adult programming and non-sports programming. So this was an opportunity to try to fill in the gaps and supplement what the rec councils offer. It is largely self-sustaining. Self Always have trouble saying that. And the registrations are collected through our office and then contractors are typically hired to provide these programs as paid instructors. And you see an example of one of the program guides. We have four program guides that come out each year, and it's between two and 300 programs a year that are offered. Quick overview on the budget. This shows the total approved operating budget for FY22. And then in the column on the right, it shows some offsetting revenues that are collected for the different facilities, and I'm gonna uh, talk to that a little bit more in a second but you can see the overall operating budget is just over three million that includes <clears> the community <throat> recreation programs which does not actually show up in the official budget also the south carroll dog park and the bennett surf dog park those expense figures are included in the administration budget but i wanted to put them here just so you all could see them next to the revenue and I'm going to point out a number that looks a little ugly, and that's the one for Hoshua with an operating budget of 833000 and 313000 in offsetting revenue. There's one very simple word for that, why that number is low, and that's COVID. We're still pulling out of that. We had a lot of groups that have not been coming to a residential camp. They are starting to come back now, so that number will come back to normal. It's just taking a little longer there. Piney Run, on the other hand, at the height of COVID, had a record year because people couldn't wait to get outside and go someplace where they could do it safely. Uh, offsetting revenue. Piney Run Park, Hoshua, and the Carroll County Sports Complex. As I mentioned earlier, they all have their own operating budget within the department. These parks offer higher uh, service levels to the public. When they were opened and when they were designed, they were never intended to be 100% self-sustaining. 
uh, fees that we charge there have to be competitive with fees at similar facilities nearby. If our boating rates are very high at Piney Run, people will go to Cadoras. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Uh, pavilion fees, same thing. If we charge too much or entrance fees, they're going to go to neighboring counties or other facilities. Also, we have a lot of fees that are waived. Uh, we waive fees for Board of Education employees, for county employees, and for seniors at Piney Run Park. Up at the sports complex, we waive fees for the Charles Carroll Rec Council. That has been done since the facility opened in 1989, also for senior softball. Also uh, military. And we have military discounts as well, correct. Hat Baker Firearms Facility, this is a little different. There are fees charged there, but that is set up in an enterprise fund. So all of the fees that are collected, all the revenue collected there, goes into a pot basically that is used to pay not only the operating costs but also any capital improvements there. So there will be times when we bank money from several years to take on a capital improvement such as a restroom facility that was added or extensive repairs to the range. So looking at one year for that doesn't always tell the story. Bennett Surf and South Carroll Dog Parks, the commissioners made decisions to take county-owned land, make it available for these parks, and basically the deal was if the community can raise the money to build the park, the department would then operate it, charge fees, membership fees that pay for the operating expenses for that. So it's not an enterprise fund, uh, it's handled out of our administration budget, but these are all parks with fees that have a little bit different backgrounds. And the department's fee schedule for these facilities, it is reviewed and approved by the Board of Commissioners every three years. So we will take a look at it, look at neighboring facilities, come to you with recommendations. We typically do this in the fall, and then we will look for approval from the board. So if there are things that you all would like to see changed, there's an opportunity for you to do that. Uh, the next uh, review of fees is scheduled for the fall of this year, 2023. The um, dog park, how many? I mean, it's it has grown, correct? It, it has grown incredibly. The one in South Carroll, 230, 240, mm -hmm. I would say. H have you renewed your membership? It's in the mail. It's in the, <laughs> <laughs> the check is in the mail. Okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the capital budget. Uh, we have a self-help program. This is where we have a combination of recreation council funds and county funds to make uh, improvements to park facilities. The projects are small capital projects, very small. They're limited to $25,000 or less. We receive about $85,000 a year in our capital budget and we take requests in September and if there's funding remaining, we will take requests once again in February to request a review by the advisory board and recommendations are made for funding. Uh, also, we have six-year capital plan. We get input from the towns, from staff, from the rec councils, from the general public, and we review those requests. They'll be presented to our Recreation and Parks Advisory Board, and they will make recommendations to the Department of Management and Budget with regards to funding. Uh, very quickly, program open space. It is the single largest funding source for our capital budget. These funds come from the state of Maryland. They are then distributed to every county in the state. We administer the funding for Carroll County, both for county projects and for municipal projects. And there's a couple of stipulations that come along with, theirs, with these funds, like every other funds. 25% uh, of the pot of money that Carroll County gets is reserved for municipal projects. And that is a town-county agreement that has specified that. 25% of the funds can only be used for land acquisition. That's a requirement of the state of Maryland. So if we get a million dollars from POS, only 500,000 of that can be used for park development projects in Carroll County. Impact fees are generated locally. Those are uh, funds that can be used to help support capital projects, but the projects have to be related to growth. We cannot do uh, maintenance of infrastructure using impact fees. If it was already there, you need a different funding source. And then general fund dollars, these are used to 
uh, for park restoration efforts, self-help projects, and potentially a match for program open space or different grants. And currently the impact fees are set at zero. Uh, zero for schools, I believe, but I think they're still I, being collected for parks? Or? I thought it was zero for both. We're collecting parks. We are? Okay, do you know how much? I apologize. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just off the top of my head, I think it's five hundred and thirty three dollars for a single family home. Oh, okay. Yeah. The impact fees, yeah. Yeah, for yes. parks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was no, never okay. I, I I absolutely School apologize. Impact fee. Is not is zero. Okay, that's that's good to know. That's good mm -hmm. to share as well. Uh, just talking a little bit about leveraging assets. I think this is one of the things that we do really well as a department. Uh, utilizing the volunteers that we have that allows us to function with a smaller operating budget and less staff than some of our neighboring counties and looking at the contributions that we get from the community I mentioned that the rec councils uh, contribute four to five million dollars they're spending that in operation of their programs when you add that to the value of their volunteer labor that's a community contribution of over 15 million dollars every year that's about four and a half dollars for every dollar in the Recreation and Parks operating budget. We have a variety of different programs that we utilize volunteer services. Uh, there's some photos on the screen here for our Helping Hands program that is similar to Adopt a Road where community groups come in and adopt a local park and hold regular cleanup days. We started a photo ambassador program last year where we have volunteer photographers going out taking pictures of our parks and in our programs we can then use those photos for some of our marketing efforts. And I mentioned Howard County earlier. Howard County has a six to eight person marketing team. We have a marketing guy, we have one. So by having other people be able to go out there and supplement that with photos, that, that works really well. There's a variety of other county goals that recreation and parks can support through their normal activities. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but education low crime rate healthy living and economic development we contribute in some matter to each of those areas we have many many opportunities to interact with the public uh, we work with all ages we have preschool school age adults seniors and visitors from out of county our rec council and advisory board meetings are open to the public we interact regularly with uh, users at our different programs or in our parks. We put out periodic needs assessment surveys, gauging what the interests are of the public and how we can meet those needs. We also offer a speakers bureau. So community groups, Lions Club and organizations like that, if they're looking for guest speakers at their meetings, uh, we can help spread the word about what we do and how they could potentially get involved. A few years back, because that, that picture I saw, we did um, these like town halls at the different parks and it was a walk with the commissioner type of yes. thing. And I'll tell you, I probably got around, I don't know, 50, 75 folks that came out and s took the first hour or whatever answering questions. And then we did a, you know, one or two mile walk, whatever it was. But, That's uh, something we're considering to do again once the weather gets a little warmer. It, it's a great way for the public to come out, uh, interact with you in a more <coughs> casual environment give yeah. you some feedback ask you questions and then get some exercise take a nice walk in the park yep, and they bring I think you had the largest crowd but just barely I think you beat Commissioner Wentz as it should be so it was close I have no now, idea now do some of those happen like in conjunction with the library there were like games there and reading is that similar concept yes uh, the partnership for a healthier Carroll County put a series on where they had one of those walks each week and they did that throughout the year. We partnered with them and most of those walks have not all occurred in county parks. Uh, the one that Commissioner Rothstein mentioned, that was a specific uh, commissioner walk, walk with them in at one of the parks in your district. Yeah. So yeah, it, was, it was fun, but again, it, it, it was different issues than the mm -hmm. typical town hall because they have their kids, their dogs, they're talking about facilities, they're talking about, you know, just, it, it was just different so it's good it's good feedback in a relaxed environment last thing I have and I'm hoping I'm not pushing up against the 15 or on the other side of the 15 but some challenges and opportunities that we have as a department uh, a big one is taking care of what we have our existing park infrastructure it is aging and everything has a shelf life so with playgrounds with pavilions as they get older 
potentially they become unsafe and at some point they have to be removed. Ideally, we have the funding in place on a regular schedule to replace those items and we've been doing a pretty good job with that. Uh, but it's something that we have to keep up with and, and it's an ongoing funding challenge to do that. Uh, meeting new demands, demographics for the county continue to change. We are aging as a county. So we have many more requests for trails than we did 20 years ago. Uh, it's funny, we still have almost the same amount of requests for ball fields, but I think that's because of the competitive nature of many of our coaches. Uh, we have a few less kids, but you know, if there was an eighth day of the week, we'd have requests for gym time and field time. And I used to coach, I know I'd want it if I could have gotten it. Uh, maintaining our existing volunteer base. There's some similarities with what we're experiencing with what the fire companies have gone through, and we want to hold on to the volunteers that we have, so we need to support them. And while we do that, we also need to maintain an acceptable liability position for the county because these volunteers are working on our behalf. So they're working under our umbrella, if you will, for insurance. We need to make sure they are doing things the right way. A couple of opportunities, again, continuing to find ways to leverage the volunteer resources, whether it's labor or funding. Uh, one of the things we've been working on with Public Works and Bureau of Facilities is evaluate how park maintenance is done. Are there ways we can do this a little bit more proactively rather than complaint driven? And we've had some great discussions back and forth and it's a challenge because all of this costs money and trying to find the best way to do things, but also that comes back to maintaining a good liability position for the county. And then lastly, uh, just promote a continuous improvement philosophy within the department. We don't wanna do things because we always did it that way. If there's a better way, we wanna find it, we wanna to try to grow and become more efficient. And as we get new staff coming through, we're getting new ideas, same is true with volunteers. So we try to take advantage of that. And hopefully I'm under 15 there. Uh, you're okay. Open <laughs> space money. Um, yes. Chris, take a slide down. There, there's, I, I don't know what the other counties think of it, but it, it just seems like the 25 percent that's buying more property makes you have to maintain more property is that worth talking to them about reducing that percentage or is that uh, something we shouldn't kick we should just take the money it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because there are people in annapolis who view program open space as a land acquisition first and foremost program and they get itchy when a lot of money is spent for development. They get really itchy if it's spent on something like a turf field that, that is not natural. So there was a time when you didn't have that required yep. uh, um, commitment for land acquisition, but that has come back. Uh, the ability to bank it and then use it wisely for acquisitions when they come up, as long as they're not pressuring us to do that, hey, you need to spend this every year. Uh, and the reality is, depending on where you are and the amount of money that you're talking about, parcel that's worthwhile, you may not be able to afford with one or two years uh, allocations. And, and you may need multiple okay years. With you banking money as long as to it date goes. they have been yes. And hopefully that does not change because we have some projects in mind that are going to take larger amounts of money. So we do try to bank for them it and be seems, ready. It seems like. Um, that money for fields, lights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it, it gets tighter and tighter. Um, I remember when uh, self-help was changed from 15 to 25 to help people do more projects, but that was like 50 years ago. I mean, right. and, and uh, it seemed like there was more money in the bank for self-helps back then. I'm not sure if it was or... That, that's been somewhat cyclical. We'll have years where we have $85,000 available and 150 gets requested. And then the next year, you know, in September, you might only have 40,000 requested. Yeah. Okay. So I think some of it is councils have multiple projects that they're working on, so then they don't come back the next year. And one other item, if I could add, with program open space, that has always been one of the most vulnerable funding sources in years past. It has been the low hanging fruit in Annapolis. So if there's been tough budget years, uh, there's been many cuts that have been made in the past. In fact, we're just getting payback money this year. It'll be the final amount of payback funds this year. But we had a 10 year stretch where we averaged a million dollars a year in POS funding. The high point was 3.6 million and the low point was 166,000. 
and that was for a capital budget for the entire county. Wow. And that's why TED staff earn, earn their money, because when they're, they're trying to guess how much is coming, right. the only sure thing is it's going to be different than what it was last year. Okay. Okay, any, uh, any questions, comments? Will be made. Uh, Commissioner Vigliotti, I don't see you, but do you have any questions, comments? Now I see you. I'm all good, but thank you very much. Okay. Thank all you, right. sir. Thank you. Good stuff. So we're skipping Ted, so next to the Ms. Hobbs. Comptroller, yes. I'm not as exciting as Rex Parks. Oh, you're very exciting. Commissioner, I'll try to, Com I'll Commissioner try to. Kyler and I had lunch with um, the state comptroller yesterday. Oh. Um, Rick, Rick, somebody, um, what's her name? Uh, Montaire. She was at lunch with us at the table. I just can't remember. I said we have the best comptroller in the state. Oh, she well, said, thank okay. you. So just let you know. I appreciate that. After this, you might not think so because I'm very. I may boring. not, and I may call her back. So we'll see. <laughs> Well, I'm Jenny Hobbs. I've met you um, prior in a few other settings, um, but I'm here today to talk about the Department of the Comptroller. Um, as exciting as it is, and I'll try to make it somewhat exciting for you guys. Um, we, you should have a organization chart in front of you of our department, and it shows the breakdown of our staff. We currently have uh, I believe it's 34 staff that are in our department, which has not changed in the 20 some years that I've been here. Um, actually, I think we used to have a few more. Um, and that comprises of the comptroller admin, which is myself, our financial system administrator, and our admin assistant. We are there taking care of bond issuance. We help with the AAA triple triple a bond rating getting all that prepared organizing the credit rating as well as working with auditors and making sure we get that clean audit um, and then i like to call them branches we have the bureau of accounting the office of procurement and collections office and i did bring the leads of those areas with me they're sitting in the back um, they are afraid to come up to the table no I'm just kidding <laughs> Um, Bobby Joe Fout is our bureau chief and she oversees quite a bit of the accounting, accounts payable, uh, the payroll department, what we like to call our grants and accounting, which is our investment officer and our grant accountant. Um, and then we also like to call our other branch under her is the financial analyst and general fund. They take care of the day-to-day -day general accounting. We break our staff up into funds more than departments because we report our financials in funds. Um, and then she also has the enterprise funds, which we have six enterprise funds, and that's the utilities fund, um, water and sewer, septage, solid waste, fire alarms, airport, did I miss one? Yeah, broadband. That's, thank you, fiber, yes. Um, so they all report under the enterprise funds. So as you can see, I just, we listed the staff that report into that and support those areas. Sure. We also have the Office of Procurement, which Maureen Dunn is our procurement officer. She has two buyers and a procurement assistant in there. Uh, another very busy office procuring and taking care of all the bids and everything that is detailed in that respect um, and then we have the collections office which is a very important role uh, they're all very important I don't mean indeed disrespect to that but um, they probably take in the most money of the county <laughs> they bill over 68,000 tax bills and collect every dollar of that tax money um, so very important jobs all around for the entire department but without the revenue we wouldn't be able to get anything accomplished um, is what I like to say that actually consists of our collection analyst and head cashier and we have the collection clerks 
and collection specialists um, who take care of processing every deed transfer that comes into the county as well as recording them and then they also take care of every dollar that comes into this county in whatever fashion it comes into electronic check cash it has to go into the collections office just like every dollar that goes out of the county goes through our department through some form of payroll or accounts payable so what i like to say on our mission is that we're the protector of the county assets i would love to get little badges and put on everybody and say we have the protector of the financial assets um, our mission is pretty simple that we want to maintain a strong financial control environment and make sure that we safeguard the county's assets we keep the checkbook and I am known for very tight reins on that checkbook um, we are one of the few agencies, I believe, that are central and actually do business with all citizen taxpayers, all employees, all vendors, all the agencies and departments that come through the county. So we are very versatile and we, we move a lot of people through. So customer service is another thing that I've always been big on. I, I, customer service, you can ask staff i'm all about customer service so that's one of the things we strive on in our department um, accuracy of course um, and then we also want to make sure we're promoting a competitive bid process after all the taxpayers um, deserve the best value for their dollar and we need to make sure that we're giving them the best and we record all the revenues and then we also provide a debt management that supports your budget um, as far as some laws our whole entire department is nothing but following laws so we have federal state local laws that guide us and I could read off the entire list that's in frame but that's not even <laughs> I don't think you want me to do that because I'll be away over by 15 minutes um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg of the laws that we have to follow and we follow those laws why because we want to make sure the county stays in compliance with everything um, and it is kind of funny because when I started listing some of these I was like wow I didn't realize like until you put them down on paper like just how many we are really every area in our department has some kind of oversight or law that we are required to follow um, so when other departments are like those guys are very mean to us they're putting the hammer down or the gavel down and it's not because we like being mean it's because we're doing the best interest of the county and the taxpayers um, for that reason so um, some of the significant changes that we've had over the last five years are I would say the whole county has seen a lot of significant changes. Um, the pandemic was huge for all of us. But the largest things we're seeing is grants, grant money coming in. So while we've had all that grant money come in, somebody's had to account for all that grant money. And that was our staff doing a lot of that. When I say we have to account for it, federal dollars have to go through what's called a single audit or a CIFA, which is the schedule of expenditures of federal awards and that is in this lovely document that you guys should have if you want some good nighttime reading to help you fall asleep I'm sure this is this is it this is our act for our annual comprehensive financial report which is put together by our own staff and audited so we don't have external um, the external auditors are not putting together our financials we're actually putting them together in-house and then they're auditing those the single audit as I said is our federal awards that we've spent and we have very stringent um, rules and regulations that we have to work with the other departments that manage those grants as well as the grants office to make sure we're following everything to a T um, some of the other things we've had is GASB statements, which is our generally accepted, um, or I'm sorry, our government 
accounting standards board that we have to follow S large ones one was leases which was a huge one that just came in and I won't bore you with the details because there's a lot of details to that statement but if you want to know more I'll be glad to sit down and tell you more about that and there is a new one coming um, on subscriptions so stay tuned we'll be talking more about that um, and then the addition of fire and EMS, that's been a strain on our department. Um, you know, it's putting pressure on us by adding employees in payroll. We still have the three payroll employees that we've had. I think we pay just over a thousand employees because we, we take care of state's attorney and um, sheriffs and then our own county um, employees. We also have new funding that we'll be tracking um, as well as procurement will be procuring additional resources um, for that there's also another reporting standard that's coming through federal it's called XBRL extensible business reporting language sounds exciting doesn't it um, no that is something that's going to be a hot topic here in the next few years where the federal government is trying to get a consistent so you can compare governments across the nation financially. Um, we're all reporting the same. And um, so that'll be coming into play as well as um, we are still looking to figure out new ways and how we can keep up with the times of accepting payments. Um, all of these new generations are wanting electronic payments, you know, and how can we help that? How can we do that? Um, there's always requests for payments over the internet or and things. So we're looking into that to see how we can best serve customers that way. Um, and with that, is technology and our challenge right now is we will have to look at upgrading our technology um, so just um, like I said we generate the only revenue we generate the only revenue is uh, tax bills and then we also do water and sewer utility billing and collection so all of the water and sewer customers that are on our systems we bill quarterly and collect quarterly um, and then our department our financial analyst actually calculates the water and sewer rates for the Department of Public Works nice. I think any questions that was a lot of information I know and it is um, are you getting a lot of phone calls from people whose assessments have gone up and People trying to figure out why you did that to them, but you didn't do it to them. So we don't do that to I them. Know, I know you don't. <laughs> I mean, I just am curious. They do. Um, collections and Belinda's back here, but we do get a lot of calls on why is my tax bill going yeah. up, mm -hmm. and we refer that to the state assessment office here in Carroll County. Um, but they do get those calls of why is it going up, and you know, the only thing we can say is every three years you get reassessed, and depending on what the state has assessed your property at. Excluding COVID time, um, which we don't like to do, um, <laughs> how, much, how much resources, people, time is spent on grants in general, you think? <laughs> a lot, That's what a thought. lot of time. Um, grants are, we love grants, right Bobby Joe? Grants are fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a lot of, money that comes in and we have one full time that currently does nothing but working with grant administrators another one that is actually calculating because we have to actually calculate all the fringe benefits and move them around for the grant administrators um, to give you an actual time it it's a lot yeah um, and then when the auditors come all of the same ones that are doing the work is then additional. Um, now, doesn't time. financial people, don't you love auditors? I thought you <laughs> didn't get along. We do, we get along great with them. <laughs> all look so happy, right? <laughs> but the other thing I like to say is it's not just, we're, it's our audit, we, we coordinate everything, but it's 
our audit as a county right. audit because we are reaching out to other departments yep. saying hey the auditors want to know x y and z and why you did this and so again when we're asking them a hundred questions and they're getting frustrated with us of why are you keep asking me these questions it's not because we're trying to be nosy it's because we're trying to give the answer and be transparent to everyone um, involved <laughs> thanks but yes we do love our jobs good any other questions you had a magic wand what would you want <laughs> in honesty no be dishonest no of course honesty I'm always honest um, new system new collections and water and sewer billing system is there you have some budget money is there a new system that you're aware of that could meet the requirements that you're talking already about already done my research <laughs> I've talked to Roberta <laughs> there's actually one that um, and I don't know how far I can go with this Marie <laughs> But I'm not going to name names, but I do know there's one that 15 other counties in the state use. Okay. So and it would meet our expectations. So you're confident in that? Was it a system that can also cross over to other departments? It okay. It is a full ERP system. It's a full ERP system. And ERP stands for? Enterprise. Help me out. Enterprise planning. No, there's an R in between. An R it. between there. Resource, <laughs> resource planning. Enterprise resource planning. That's Enterprise it. resource planning yes. system that goes across so multiple departments that is used in 15 or 16 jurisdictions already in the state. And that would be the one thing that you believe would make your life much easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. I look at staff because I always like the input of staff. I'm not going to make a decision, and I'm, I've always liked that. I don't make a decision for me. I make a decision for them, and I always want them to. I've already told Belinda, her staff is going to be the first to like see a demo and decide whether that right. works. No, I understand. It's just. Um, but I mean, yes, it, that's it, at it, the top of my wish list. Well. And then maybe another person or two in the department, which I know that's asking for a little extra. One is for Maureen because, of, and I know we're not supposed to be going into budget. <laughs> no, no, that, that but but, but it's, um, it's not necessarily going to budget. But it's understanding um, where you are today, where you want to be tomorrow, mm -hmm. and the requirements yep. that may be necessary for you to go from today to tomorrow. Sure. So, and that's just and I appreciate that's good. That. So yeah, I mean, okay. a definitely an additional buyer would be helpful, especially adding a new department that's a rather large department. Mm -hmm. We used to have three buyers, right? And now we're down to not I shouldn't say down but we're we are down to two an additional buyer would be very helpful um, with procuring because I'm sure fire and EMS is going to be mm -hmm. well, they've already seen the influx and then of course anything you adopt in the capital the CIP budget is additional stuff that they right. all has to go through procuring. if I ask mr. Burt pokey when he comes up here the one thing he'd want will he also say the ERP uh, system yes okay he will because Jenny told him to okay, okay. <laughs> just again want to understand the, the great thing is the ERP system doesn't have to be purchased all at one time you can purchase specific but right now we okay. have a system that's 1980s and that needs to be please. so when Ms. Uh, Commissioner Kyler was in college basically and you know <laughs> you were in, actually in college well, you were in college in the 80s well, in the 80s you were out of college in the 80s. I was out. You were out of college in the 80s. <laughs> to, put in perspective, oh, man, I, hurts. to put it in perspective, I went down this past summer, as you know, and I worked, yep. I started in collections 21, well, almost 22 years ago, and I was able to jump right on the window and pitch in with them right along, and it, no change on the right. system. Okay. Our, so. our computer was the size of a refrigerator, and you did key punch cards, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Yeah, I remember the ticker <laughs> tape. So, okay. A quick question for you. If sure. I could. Um, so, on the grant side of thing, you said you have one person working on grants full time. We have a full time grants accountant. We have um, another accountant that she's kind of split. When you say across the board, Bobby Joe. Yeah. Um, now, each different area has should have a grant administrator Understood. where. 
but as far as the accounting side we have okay. one I was just grant account. I was just curious given you know all the grants and earmarks that are floating around out there um, all of us that were at Mako heard about a number of them that were out there and just want to make sure we're being as proactive and competitive as possible so if that's an area we need to address you know please let us know well, the one great thing is um, an ERP system most of them today have a grant module now okay that helps with that managing and could go across everything. Gotcha. That's good nice. to know. Good <laughs> <No>. to know. <laughs> I'm like pleading for this. Just so you know, there she is money in the budget. I don't for know. The, yeah. There has been money for the collection system. I feel like I, I feel like I threw the softball up in the air and you just whack it. So that's right. Okay. Thank you oh so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, Jeff Daggett is, is on his way back up here right yeah, now. No. <laughs> He's asking for more yeah, people, Yeah, he didn't too. get a chance to do that. <laughs> um, and then it, we're skipping Mark as well. So. We're supposed to be. Yes. Mr. Bokey. Nobody's going to hang around. Oh, <laughs> you cleared the room. Was it something you said? How, how do you feel about that? <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So just give me the briefing paper. You can have handouts. It all works. Good afternoon. Promise I won't talk budgets because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> couldn't even start because I think facilities has sixty-two different budgets and. Engineering has another dozen, and so uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna steer steer clear of budgets. But I'm here to give you an overview of Public Works. Um, as most of you know, I've been here just about six months now, um, and and I can tell you, you know, the staff is amazing. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a firm believer that the 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 staff is organization's most valuable asset. Um, you know, we have 313 positions. Obviously, not all of them were filled at the moment. We have 35 vacancies, uh, which is approximately 11% um, vacancy rate. And that's spread over nine bureaus, plus a transit program, plus the administrative staff uh, that, that sits on the second floor with me. Um, I also think it's important to note that a large majority of our staff is considered essential. Um, so I, I, I hope that doesn't go unnoticed. You know, we're the, we're the first ones out there plowing snow and clearing trees and assisting with accidents and sinkholes and all that other fun stuff. Um, so just to expand a little bit more on, on the staff, we have three deputy directors. I think you've probably met most of them uh, by now, but it's Mr. Doug Brown. He is in charge of the Bureau of Fleet and Warehouse, Roadway Operations and Engineering. Next is Eric Burdine. He's in charge of the airport, building construction, and solid waste. And finally, Jason Green, he's in charge of facilities, permits, and utilities. Um, and, and as Jeff and Jenny mentioned, um, the, a couple of those bureaus are enterprise funds. Um, the, the septage, airport, solid waste, and utilities are the, are the four, five, five that we have. Um, Similar to other groups, um, you know, vacancies are a concern, but I don't, you know, it's not different than any other uh, organization across the country right now. Um, but specifically to public works, um, I have a couple concerns that I just want to bring to the table in terms of vacancies. So our roadway operations group um, has a staff about 60, 70 people, and right now we have 20 vacancies, and most of them are CDL drivers. So, you know, um, Mostly because com competitive rates with, with other trucking companies in the area. Um, I, Hagerstown's a big uh, hub for Amazon and FedEx, so a lot of folks are going out there and getting, you know, double, triple <laughs> some of the rates we're paying. So um, that's a struggle, but we're going to, um, you know, we're, we're working on some ideas to address it. I think HR's been fantastic in, in, in getting out there. Um, I've talked with Heather Powell uh, yesterday at Workforce Development about um, some. Um, some some youth apprenticeship programs that we can do with career tech and and some of the other schools. So we're we're going to get there, um, but I just, again wanted to bring that to the forefront. And then also our uh, Bureau of Engineering. Uh, it's a smaller smaller bureau, about twenty two people, and currently we have six vacancies. So that's S staying on the CDL drivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what are the numbers? I mean, you said the vacancy numbers, but what are um, 
the typical wages that CDL drivers are receiving now? Uh, $15, $16 an hour, I think, for a truck from driver one. us? Yeah. And then from Amazon or Hagerstown? I'd have it, to look at, uh, you know, probably. I mean, the, is, is it the $40 an hour type of? Yeah, and a lot of them do plus miles and things like that. So, you know, we need to, you know. So it really is a very difficult mountain to climb when yeah. comparing to. And especially the, the supply and demand issues yeah. right now. You yeah. know, we were talking about some cars at the port yesterday with, um, with with the transit folks, and they can't get enough drivers down at the port of Baltimore. We have vehicles sitting down at the port of Baltimore, and right. they can't get enough drivers. Yeah, nobody can right. get CDL drivers. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then um, the vehicles that we're driving, um, that you need to get, are all of them, you must have CDL, or is some of them are encouraged to have CDL? It, it's a must, and I think it's the okay. CDL Class 2 okay. um, is, is what we qu require for some of the dump yeah. trucks and the 5-ton, yeah. 10-ton yeah. vehicles. A lot, of the, a lot of the single axles require CDLs, and then in Maryland, there's single axles that you don't need a CDL, but you still need your med card. So it's, and then, it's and anything with air brakes too. I I, yeah, I believe yeah. is Maryland's a little tougher than some of the other states. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. All right. Yeah. So jumping back to the Bureau of Engineering, um, our vacancy rate's about twenty five percent in that group. Um, we have two positions that we outsource: um, our our bridge engineer and our traffic engineer. Um, we we have contracts with private consultants that, that staff part-time employees in, in our office. Um, and frankly, we, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, just doing the studies on the bridges and culverts, um, traffic impact studies that come in from developers, they, they handle all those things. So next up, I will dive into uh, the nine bureaus plus transit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, we'll call it 10. <laughs> but I will uh, start with the airport, uh, led by Mr. Mark Myers. He's the airport manager. Um, he has two other full-time staff working with him out there. Uh, they're in charge of day-to-day -day operations at the airport, um, maintenance of the grounds, fuel tanks. Um, we, we lease all the hangars, so we manage those contracts. Um, any, any upkeep that they need, new roofs, new doors, uh, things like that, whole, whole manage those projects. Um, and, you know, obviously the airport, we have the safety enhancement project which involves uh, relocating and extending the existing runway, and you, you, you've been briefed on, on some of that project. Next is building construction, uh, led by Mr. John, Bra John Bowers and three other full-time employees. Uh, this group is primarily composed of project managers, and they serve on the county's behalf as the owner-developer for new and renovated county buildings. Uh, some of these projects include the state's attorney building, uh, the new sheriff headquarters, Charles Carroll Community Center, and the Public Safety and Training Center, all kind of the, the, the hot ones right now. Um, Bureau of Engineering, led by Mr. Crystal Nautchen. Uh, we, we kind of talked about some of their staffing already, but they, um, I like to think of them as our, our, our transportation branch. Um, they do everything from the initial survey out there to design, construction inspection. Uh, we talked about traffic studies, bridge, culvert, storm drain designs. Um, really, anything to do with the road uh, goes through the engineering group. Uh, next is facilities, led by Mr. Justin Magano. Um, their beer is sort of broken up into two major groups. Um, I, I look at it as like a buildings and grounds group. Um, so they have some leadership on, on both sides of that. And then they also have a handful of project managers. Um, in addition to all the county buildings, I think we're up to 60, 65 buildings that they, that they manage. They're in charge of the community college as well. So they have two or three dedicated staff members um, that, that work out there. And this bureau handles everything from HVAC to electrical and plumbing. Uh, and stormwater ponds, landscaping, turf management on, on the ground side. Next is fleet and warehouse management. Uh, Mr. Reed Oliver has been up here a few times already asking for vehicles, um, but you know they're in charge of the purchase, management, and service of all county vehicles, partner agencies, and nonprofit groups. So it's more than just the kind of vehicles you see out on our lots and out at the maintenance center. Warehouse operation. Um, they inventory and manage uh, about 1,500 items uh, out there. So, you know, during COVID, all the, all the masks and gloves and hand sanitizer came there, all the custodial needs, um, 
at the maintenance center, we have a NAPA representative out there, so, so they help us with all the, the auto parts that we need. Um, next is permits inspection, led by Mr. Mike Zepp. Uh, they, you know, as it sounds, establish and enforce um, code to ensure the public safety of residents. Um, and th they also issue licenses to electricians, plumbers, gas fitters, and other utility contractors. Road operations, led by Mr. Jim Cook. Uh, he was up here this morning talking about guardrails. Uh, their, their primary goal is to take care of the roads out there. Uh, we have about 1,000 miles of road, uh, most of which are paved. I think 970 some under miles and the rest um, being uh, gravel road still. And in addition to that, 154 bridges and, and structures that, that they maintain and keep clean and rehab and replace. Um, and obviously this time of year, they're, they're in charge of salting, brining, and, and plowing the roads when that, those events happen, <laughs> particular events. Uh, next is solid waste, uh, led by Mr. Cliff Engel. Uh, currently we have um, one active landfill, known, formerly known as the Carroll County Resource Recovery Park, but most people refer to it as the Northern Landfill. So if you ever hear those two can be used interchangeably. There's also four closed landfill sites, Hoods Mill, John Owings, Bark Hill, Hodges. And you know, most notably with uh, uh, solid waste, we are kicking off the master planning process. Um, that those documents got signed. And we're having kickoff meetings with uh, the engineer to see what we can do with that site with the um, 326 acres we just bought. Uh, utilities led by Mr. Andrew Watcher. He's responsible for all water sewer uh, systems, primarily in the Freedom Districts, the, you know, the, the 26 corridor, and the sewer system in Hampstead, and two minor systems, um, uh, Park, Hills and Park Hill and Pleasant Valley are, are the two, two, two small ones that we have out there. Um, they also manage all the uh, capital improvement projects related to those uh, systems, handle the O&M, and also the, the treatment plants for both water and, and wastewater. And finally, uh, the transit is our one person show led by Ms. Stacy Graham, formerly Stacy Nash. <laughs> we have 45 county owned vehicles and all the drivers and management services is provided by Ride With Us, a, a nonprofit organization that, that helps, helps us out there. Um, as she detailed, I think uh, last week she was here, um, the three services are the demand response, trailblazers, and veteran services. So just to wrap up, I think I have a couple minutes left, um, just some of the challenges um, that I wanted to kind of touch on. Um, staffing, uh, you know, if, if I had a magic wand, we would have a butt in every single one of those chairs. Um, I don't think that's ever gonna happen, so you know, we're gonna eventually get to the point of, you know, talking about level of services that we are providing and maybe some things that we can't um, provide given the level of, of staffing, but I think we're not quite there yet. Um, land acquisitions, you know, the, the airport property has, has required some pretty big purchases uh, that we've already kind of went over and the, and the Greenwood campus. Um, we're gonna have some land acquisition issues coming up here in the future. Um, next, I, you know, Jeff mentioned it, you know, just um, coordination between facilities and rec and parks because we do maintain grounds in, in most of the um, park facilities. Uh, um, we do park checks and, and cut grass, so we've been kind of work sharing, and we're just trying to figure out the best way to do that moving forward. Um, Bureau of Facilities is rolling out um, the card access systems in, in conjunction with Department of Technology Services, so they've been slowly getting around to all the um, county buildings to make sure we all have the same security set up, the same swipe in, the, the same level of, of security as we see here in the county building. Um, and finally, the, the water and sewer rates. I think, you know, we're going to have to have some tough conversations here in the future about what that looks like and, and where we're going and um, the, the needs of that, that group. Didn't we just adjust them last year? Yes, there was a, what, a 3% was that was built in the last three years. I think it was that. Yeah. Or was, I think that was, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I don't remember the number, but I mean, I know it was significant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, before that, it was quite some time. So, yeah. What's put, which has put pressure on the system? Okay. So we'll have those discussions at a later date, just trying to throw it all on the surface here. But uh, again, your, your packet goes into a little more details on, on each bureau. Um, 
you know the the mission and goals of our department. Um, something I should have mentioned earlier: the the maintenance center out on Old Meadow Branch Road, um, that houses facilities, uh, fleet and warehouse, and roads department. And there's also the, our our fuel fuel centers out there. And maybe half a mile up the road before you get there is our transit building. So that's where we're um, spread out across the county. How many um, other groups, agencies, whatever use that fuel? Everyone. Everyone. And, yep. And it, I assume it's a card system. It's documented and it's split up to who used what. And yep. That fuel man pin. I think y'all should have got a card yep. um, when you first started. Yeah. What else? Questions? Thoughts? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you already used your mag magic wand once, so you're not going to be asked again. <sighs> uh, but um. Do something. <clears throat> Brian, can you the, remind me? Oh, sorry, go no, ahead. I, go ahead. No, go just ahead. real quick, the transportation. Um, transit specifically. Transit <clears throat> is all of Carroll County transit discretionary, or is a part discretionary and other parts non-discretionary? It's all non-discretionary meaning you don't have to qualify is that That's what you were true. asking that can't be true what do you i don't as think far as funding do we need transit? oh funding oh, I, does, I, does the do county our, have to provide yes. transit? do we need do we must do we have to provide transit in carroll county if so what is it and if not you know or if so is it all of it if not what parts i believe the answer to that is just no i i've, I've had this conversation with stacy and, and we can dig a little bit deeper um, into that, but I'm I, yeah. 95% sure it's no. And be very clear to anyone listening, I am not saying I'm recommending doing away with transit. I'm trying to understand discretionary, non-discretionary funds that we are using in the different departments. Thank so. you. Yes, and, and I'll clarify. And what, what I was referring to, anybody in the county could, could take the system. Um, you don't have to be a certain age, a certain veteran status right, right anybody who wants to ride could could right. use the on-demand or hop on a trailblazer okay and, and I think um, not that you implied anything right. but <laughs> transit like a lot of things would be tough to evaluate right now because they're still recovering from COVID and and that makes <clears throat> it tough to really yeah. look at it and although the simple answer is probably no as a in a general rule it's something we wouldn't have to provide but i would believe there are lots of strings attached with all of the um monies that you know um federal and, and state monies that we've received and so the, i am sure it's a much more complex answer to yes. the question right, right. The yeah very high level yeah i i'm just threw it out there i apologize yeah. commissioner karen yeah actually i am um, i'll follow up with you I, Thank you again for the, I had a fantastic visit with you and your staff out Great, at the yeah. landfill. I encourage everybody to do it. If you haven't done it yet, I found it fascinating. And I wanted to follow up with you on a couple of things that were brought up there, but sure. I can do that later and share them with my fellow commissioners. Yeah, thank you for bringing that. Every, everyone is welcome to, to join us, to come out, you know, give me a holler and we'll, we'll take you around. Let us know how much time you have because we'll, we'll certainly fill up that block with, uh, with our stories and background. It was worth it. Mm -hmm. The, um, the property adjacent to the landfill that we purchased, um, we, we have a vision for that. Is there, and that's a long-term vision, is there a short-term or uh, inter intermediate-term vision for that? I think in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be able to identify where the next cell or two is going to be in that landfill. Uh -huh. um, so for now, you know, we're going to start the environmental studies right away okay. and identify the pieces of property that are most valuable to the landfill. And, and that's where we can fill the land. <laughs> so yeah. um, right. that's okay. that's the short term goal. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, the long term goal is, you know, new new entrance, new customer drop off, new recycling areas, things right. like that. Right. OK. Cool. Any uh, anything else, Commissioner Vigliotti? You good? Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Commissioner. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Chief. Okay. <laughs>
when I when I let him know that um, two two of his colleagues had to uh, bug out of today, he said, "Oh, good. That gives me an extra half an hour." So in the next in the next <laughs> eleven minutes, you have. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Briefing folder, and in there you also have a copy of our MOU, a copy of our ESAC bylaws, and some uh, additional so response data from FY22. Ooh, that, that would look pretty darn good. Thank you, something. Badge. Let me just pull up my. <clears throat> So, uh, good afternoon, Commissioners, and in my uh, brief amount of time, I'm going to give you an overview of the uh, Department of Fire and Emergency Medical Services, and we're going to focus on how we got here, where we are now, and uh, where we're going along with some of our uh, future challenges. So I'm happy to report that uh, we are moving quickly with our hiring process. Uh, yesterday, our HR department reached out to 16 candidates that we've identified uh, and offered them a conditional offer of employment. So that'll be contingent on their uh, occupational, physical, and their psychological uh, evaluation. What were the positions? Lieutenants? Uh, so yes, so these are the lieutenants. Twelve of them will be station lieutenants and four will be the countywide shift commanders. So uh, that's based on about the last two months of processing them, which included uh, an assessment center, uh, physical ability test, the, the written exam, interviews, background checks, mm. and uh, we're, we're confident that we've gotten the, the best of all the applicants. That's so, great news. Congratulations. So, yes. So everything uh, moving forward with <clears throat> them, they would start on the 2nd of March. They'll be assigned to the training center, and then we'll start processing. And uh, we also have an integrated program where we're going to do basically an officer candidate program for them to get oriented to the county. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are we going to talk about? Um, who or what is the uh, Department of Fire and EMS? Look real quickly because you got copies of it. Mission, vision, and core values, which I believe are inherent to the success of any organization. Uh, we're going to look at our current organizational chart and where it will be going in the near future. Talk a little bit about our data and some data analytics. Uh, our staffing plan, current and future. A little overview of our hiring process so everybody understands our uh, next phase and then following our challenges and any questions and answers that you all may have. So the Department of uh, Fire and EMS was actually created by uh, county ordinance uh, promulgated by this body uh, in October of 2020. And why that's significant is it takes uh, what had been done for the previous nearly 200 years and made it an official governmental function of county government. So with that, it becomes a basically a fiduciary responsibility and it also incurs all the liabilities for uh, all of the actions associated with that, which is a, a pretty significant uh, change to the county and puts us in the forefront to assure that things are done based on current standards and done efficiently. Uh, chapter 37 of the Carroll County Code of Regulations followed that, which codified uh, who we were, what we were all about. That was amended this past fall uh, in order to be consistent with uh, the human resource elements of having employees and them operating under our parameters, which are uh, a little bit different than the normal uh, eight hour per day county employees. Uh, the other thing that the uh, code identifies is it identifies each of the 14 volunteer fire companies as operational components of the department. So it recognizes that they in fact are the uh, delivery arm along with our own personnel and uh, currently the volunteer fire companies uh, are the proprietors of the fire stations and all of the assets that we would use for fire uh, protection, special operations, and EMS are uh, solely owned by the volunteer company. So uh, inherently, we have to have a partnership. Um, we're the administrators of it all. We're working in concert with them, and uh, we're moving forward with that. Uh, this morning, I had about an hour-long uh, meeting with um, 
Chief Ruck from Sykesville, who heads up the Chiefs organization, and about how we're going to implement some of these things. We're going to start some working groups as early as Monday to start uh, putting things together. Uh, we have a combination system, and what a combination system is, um, for the new commissioners who may not be familiar with that, combination means just that, is we have career staffing who are county employees along with volunteers who are vetted by each of the companies but has to meet minimal county standards operating in the same stations. Uh, so along with that, um, there is some polarization that's always going to be there organizationally, but I liken it to the military model. If I'm fighting a, a conflict on the other end of the world and I activate the National Guard or a reserve component, even though on a daily basis they may operate under a different umbrella, they now become part of the regular military. And our concept of a combination department is similar. Um, we all have to be operationally ready, and when an incident comes out, they're all acting as part of Department of Fire and EMS. So with that comes some of the traditions of the volunteers, some of the culture that will develop of the career people, and uh, my obligation is to make sure that works. Will there be differences of opinion? Will there be some conflicts? And uh, we want to get away from that us and them and make it ours. And uh, most of the other jurisdictions who have come before us who have done the same thing, they have not been successful in that, but we're committed. And in speaking with the volunteer leadership, that's going to be our direction. We're going to make it work. Uh, we're going to have some growing pains. Everything's not going to be perfect. But at the end of the day, we're going to make it work. And that's just, uh, you know, the economic feasibility of this is contingent on us having a strong volunteer component. And along with that, we also need to have the career people because uh, we're no longer in a perfect environment to volunteer, and that's a statewide problem. The old guys still invite you to breakfast, say you must be. I just haven't had time. I'm going to be there. I'll make sure it's a day when you're there. So, uh, yes, and those people that have given 40, 50 years, they're just as important, and their opinions matter just as much. And that's what I, we can't lose sight over. Um, we have an integrated chain of command, which we did several months ago. And what that means is when a call comes out, who is going to be in charge? Um, with our career officers uh, being hired when they're uh, in the front seat of the unit and they're the ones on the call, they'll be in charge. If we have a multi-station response, uh, the volunteers have a system in place, and for the time being, they're still going to be in, at the top of that food chain, and really the only ones that could trump that would be myself or uh, my two assistants. Uh, but beyond that, it, it's appropriate that the volunteers would operationally be in charge of uh, their areas. And we don't see the necessity to come in unless we had some kind of catastrophic event which really got complicated and uh, that, that's probably a once in a decade type of event. So we're going to stay with our integrated chain of command. Um, and that goes to what you said just a minute ago, that, that Army analogy, that military analogy. One of the challenges is to have a very clear transfer of authority. Yes. So when they come underneath something, they know who's in charge and who's doing what to whom. Um, and I would imagine that's where others have uh, maybe failed or not have succeeded as well as they could because of the clumsiness of it all. Um, so having that transfer of authority uh, embedded in this process, I would imagine, and I would expect you're working hard on that. So yes. everybody's bought in, and I would think the ESAC is a large, you know. Yes, ESAC's part of it. Part of that. And uh, we had the Fire Operations uh, Committee, uh, which we're probably going to transition that under a different umbrella. Right now it's under CC Visa, but with our... Um, operating platform that we have now that'll probably become an operational committee under the department yeah. and they'll report directly to me we're trying to streamline things in the interim uh, we've been working now for over a year <laughs> on standard operating procedures right. that will be the guidelines by which we operate so there shouldn't be an, a lot of uh, questions on an incident scene it'll be already there it'll be an established policy okay. And the other thing to understand is our memorandum of understanding and uh, 
Roberta will validate this, which took uh, months to go on. Uh, we, we brought everything to the table, lots of discussions, and now we have a signed document which essentially uh, delineates this is what the volunteer corporations will do, this is what the county will provide, this is how we will operate. And it's going to be evolving as well and subject to interpretation, but uh, we think we have a good document uh, to move forward. And as you all know, and you have a copy of it, we've developed and implemented a strategic plan, and that comes under the ESAC umbrella, and uh, we're moving into the next phase of that. We just uh, came up with a parallel document that identified where we were in the process, and we've probably accomplished uh, greater than 50% of what we set out to do uh, a year ago. So we have a mission statement. I'm certainly not going to read that to you, but you have that for your purview. and. Um, I'm just going to recognize, I'm going to read the last sentence. We recognize our human resources as being integral to our mission and will always support our members, both career and volunteer. And we feel that that's important for the mission statement, not only to say who we are, but what we're all about. And that uh, really preserves our concept. There's our vision. And then we have what we're calling core values. And these core values are similar to what other organizations would do. And the last thing says, tradition, we will preserve and honor our past, define the present, and create the future. Um, we acknowledge the years of service that the volunteer system has made, but by their own direction, it's time to move forward because things are not in Carroll County where they were even five years ago, and uh, as, as our data will tell you. Uh, there's our organizational chart. Um, as it exists currently, you'll notice a broken line to ESAC, who is in an advisory capacity. Uh, we have our medical director, Dr. Uh, Stephanie Kemp, who is critical because about uh, 70 to 80 percent of what we do is EMS, and she is the legal authority that guides us under the state COMAR regulation, Title 30, which is EMS for the state of Maryland. And so she's uh, very important, and we're going to be doing a budget initiative with that to increase her hours. But she is with us uh, way beyond what she's contracted for and is really making a difference in us identifying some of our uh, gaps in our quality improvement and quality assurance. Uh, my administrative assistant, she's probably really the director, uh, Callie, she's uh, whatever I know, Callie knows, and very trusted employee, very thorough at what she does. Um, currently, we have our EMS officer, Michael Stoner, and um, underneath that, we have our billing technician that we've hired, and she's preparing us uh, for a new RFP and to take over billing, hopefully for all the companies as of June the 1st. So we'll have them administratively under us. They'll still make their money till they uh, transition over. But by streamlining that, that's going to make the what's known as the CMS, which is Medicare and Medicare, their windfall monies available to us, which we estimate could be as much as $5 million. So that could certainly em enhance our revenues uh, with that. She, she could potentially be incredibly busy almost yes busy. and that that's one of the things that we have to look at in our challenges is she's going to be almost overwhelmed the day she walked in the yeah. door and the other part of that is is all of our inquiries that we get from attorneys and things like that we're working with a comptroller because they're getting a new system to address that but there's just a lot of moving parts to billing and if we don't dot every i cross every t it's not a matter of losing revenue it's more of a matter of we're not in compliance with federal regulations so uh, we have to watch that area and that's an area that's going to have to expand uh, at some point. Um, also under Mike Stoner are four shift commanders, one for each of our four shifts, 24 hours on, 72 hours off. Initially, Mike Stoner is going to be over top of them. In the future, as we hire more people, we see the need for uh, an operations section and function, which would be another uh, chief level officer to s oversee overall day-to-day -day fire and EMS operations, but uh, we don't see a need for that yet. Um, currently, the volunteers operate uh, 
as 14 companies and we've divided the county into three battalions which i'll show you a map of in a little bit but those battalions on any given day the volunteers among the 14 companies uh, have a duty chief for each of those battalions so on any multiple company response house fires entrapments those kind of things um, the expectation is that one of those duty chiefs responds to provide redundancy with that when our shift commander comes online uh, about June the 1st for responding, we will have a shift commander assigned to all of those calls. So that shift commander, if no volunteers are available to respond, will assure that command continuity and we'll have a command level officer on every scene. Uh, if he's not used in that function, that will assure we have a safety officer or they will partner with the volunteer chief officers to expand our capabilities for command and control. Uh, so that's a, a future occurrence. And uh, then we have Kevin Fox, who is our training health and safety officer. Uh, he does a lot of functions, mainly all of our compliance issues, which we have many of. Uh, the quartermaster position that we hope to get, which will take care of all the uh, volunteer personal protective equipment, uh, our annual occupational physicals, and all those other areas. Um, so with our hiring of personnel and our response times, a couple of things that uh, we try to meet. There's a national standard called NFPA 1710, uh, and for our EMS, it looks at putting an ALS provider on any scene uh, countywide uh, within 10 minutes. If you look at the uh, areas here, you'll see some overlap. Some of them are in white. The yellow are the companies that overlap into other areas. And then I'll break that down into five minute areas where we have some gaps in coverage and it's just the nature of our geography. Mm -hmm. um, the goal is under 1710, one paramedic on the scene within 10 minutes, two paramedics within 15 minutes for high acuity patients. Those would be patients with severe trouble breathing, cardiac events including cardiac arrest, shooting, stabbings, electrocutions, unconscious overdoses, and the goal is within 15 minutes. What that does, that reduces significantly the potential to have a margin of error, giving wrong medications, wrong doses, not being able to do certain procedures. Uh, availab availability of first responders within 10 minutes to any scene. Our driver program, where we're initially putting a driver at every fire station by the end of next year, and the intent of that is when our EMS units are on another call, we can get at least one person there that can start CPR, manage an airway, control bleeding. Um, so our goal is continuity and consistency of coverage. Uh, for a cardiac arrest under this national standard, we need about four to six people, uh, which means we're going to change our response profile, and it might take as many as two stations to manage one, one cardiac arrest. Having our chase cars will guarantee we'll have at least three people there, and then with the driver at each station, that'll get us our four. For a house fire, we're required to have 15 people to respond. Uh, that means on the scene, um, 15 people within between 10 and 12 minutes. And for a commercial building, which includes all of your institutional occupancies, your retail, mercantile, uh, multi-occupancy dwellings such as apartments, institutional areas uh, such as our proposed veterans home, uh, assisted living, all of that, 28 people. And to get 28 people there to meet that threshold uh, can be quite a challenge on some days. So what we're finding is most of our working incidents currently, it takes the entire Carroll County Department to provide enough staffing on those incidents. Uh, the good news is this past year we only had 42 what we will term as working incidents where everybody was needed on an incident scene. So 42 times uh, compared to over 19,000 for EMS, uh, we're in good shape. Uh, you can look at this on your own. This is our data from 2021, and it breaks down. Uh, and I'll just uh, real quickly say that Westminster last year and this year continues to be our busiest station, followed by Sykesville, followed by Mount Airy, followed by Tawnytown, followed by Manchester. So we're going to be staffing the top three by June the 1st, and then in July we're going to be bringing on uh, Mount Airy, 
Manchester, and then Reese. So uh, true to our plan, our objective has been to staff the people with the highest call volume, and then ultimately in the FY25, everyone will have some staffing. So in 2022, and even though the map here says 2021, we got a new map and it looked exactly the same, and this one had better graphics, so we put this one up. But uh, as you can see, we are concentrated into five major areas, which is the Westminster area, um, Tawny Town, what I'll call the northeastern corner of Carroll, which includes Lineborough, Manchester, and Sykesville, with Manchester and Sykesville quickly coming together into one. Uh, then we have Mount Airy, and then we have the Sykesville Freedom District. And so the darker the colors, the more frequency of responses. So calendar year 2022, close to 24,000 responses. Um, out of those, about 18,000 were EMS. Uh, included in the whole number, which is something we're watching, is nearly 3,000 mutual aid responses. That means 3,000 times that we cross the border into other counties. And through our Metro Chiefs group, we all talk about these things on a quarterly basis, um, and we're a little bit concerned in, in um, Frederick County, but part of that given is the fact that Mount Airy sits partially in Frederick County, so that's a given. But the other concern is Baltimore County, with their increased call volume and hospital waiting times, we're going into uh, Randallstown, Reisterstown, Owings Mills, and even Pikesville on some days. So that that's concern, but... Um, the retort to that from Baltimore County was, here's our 2,200 calls we ran into Carroll County. So it, it, a lot of this is driven by population shift. If we look at the demographic shift and we just look at the uh, breakdown of people in terms of elderly population, COVID is certainly a dynamic uh, with this. So our priority is staffing to meet EMS needs. Again, I'm sorry, 44 working fires. Future trends, uh, based on our increases over the last several years, we're looking at a 2% increase annually, which equates to uh, 3,375 additional calls. And again, as part of what the uh, planning department does with adequate facilities, uh, we are engaged with them and we're looking at uh, projects that go in and part of that is is looking at what we have available um, there's our five minute response areas um, and our plan will be 15 transport units uh, hopefully all at the paramedic level to get two providers to the scene within about 10 minutes uh, the ALS chase vehicles, their job will be to supplement the ALS. We have two coming in plus the shift commander, and then we have a budget request for a third car that would stabilize things so the shift commander will be able to get uh, all of their other duties done without being tied up too much on EMS calls. Um, our suppression staffing, meaning our fire protection and technical rescue, is going to be reliant on volunteer staffing for years to come under our current staffing models, uh, except for our uh, three stations that will have lieutenants and a driver, uh, <laughs> still is a minimal sized crew. So um, our goal is, and our standard right now is before a fire apparatus goes out, it's to have four people on board. So. Uh, we continue to work on that so we can meet the threshold. So our staffing plan for this year, Sykesville, Tawny Town, and Westminster, plus two chase cars and the shift commander. Uh, we have floaters on each shift, and uh, what a floater is, it's a person that will be at least a firefighter EMT. They're extra staffing, and it will allow us to have up to six people each shift that will be off either due to scheduled vacation time and leave um, or people that call in sick. So before we get into an overtime uh, situation, we will have six people on each shift to help offset that. When they're not offsetting positions, they'll be extra uh, either in stations uh, that aren't staffed yet so we can provide extra EMS staffing or to supplement our busier stations uh, so they'll be assigned out of Mount Airy and Westminster. 
second year, which begins on July the 1st, we add Mount Airy, Manchester, and Reese, and hopefully another chase car, two more floaters, and we're looking at a community uh, paramedic. Uh, we're meeting with the health department. They've established a task force with uh, different components of the medical community to look at that. And then in our final year, we bring on the other seven companies uh, that will be each with their medic unit staffed and one driver. And beyond that, we're going to have to look at the data. We'll have to look at where we are in terms of what are the county's other needs. And certainly, we'll be at the uh, recommendation of what the commissioners decide based on uh, input that we provide you. So there's our total staffing plan. And again, you've got a copy of all of this. So 88 finishing at FY23 for the last month. Then we'll be adding hopefully 60. And then in the final year, 84, which will give us 232 operational people. And then we're looking with some other enhancements of 10 additional staff would put our total staffing at 242 personnel. Um, so ultimately, we're going to have the EMS chase cars which the county is divided into the three battalions. So take the number 10 and put it in front of each of them. This is the first battalion, which goes from Lineborough um, down to the Gamber area. We have our third battalion, which is our southern battalion, uh, which is the Mount Airy, Sykesville, Winfield um, area, and Gamber. And then we have our Western Battalion, or the 2nd Battalion, which is Tawny Town, Pleasant Valley, uh, Union Bridge, New Windsor, and Harney. And again, lots of these areas have some large uh, areas that uh, typically don't have a lot of call volume. So we believe that our uh, strategic deployment should work to cover the county well. Um, as you know, we're involved in hiring. We've been doing a lot of marketing. Uh, we closed for our four fire and EMS positions exclusive of lieutenant. This past Monday, we have 347 applications. And uh, we believed we would get more. Uh, one of our challenges is, is the way that we are hiring is we're avoiding a six-month recruit school, which would have meant we would have had X number of employees have to find instructors and all the logistics that go with that, but we would be providing no service during that time. So as a result, we've decided, at least in the initial years of this system, is to hire people that are pre-qualified. And what that means is they have national credentials for both fire and EMS, or we are going to hire some paramedics only because of the challenge in getting that. And you can look at this. Uh, charter matrix later on to see the requirements, which basically are the requirements that any of the surrounding jurisdictions do in a six-month academy. We're doing it because it also allows us to bring in experienced people. It also takes into consideration the people working for 13 of the volunteer companies uh, who may have some longevity there. It gives them an opportunity to compete uh, based on the standards. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people haven't been able to read and follow directions. So some people who have been given at least a year to know about these requirements um, have been dropped from the process initially, but we still have a pretty uh, strong number. So next week we'll be doing written testing for the firefighter EMT, firefighter paramedic, paramedic and driver operator positions, and then the next three months will be the processing till we can get down to our needed numbers. Uh, there's just a little matrix that shows you the hiring process. It looks complicated, but it, it flows in such a way that we're able to validate everybody, both physically, psychologically, and in terms of their uh, aptitude and existing knowledge for the job. So uh, that will lead to the final offer, hopefully sometime in late May, and then we'll have a couple of weeks to get them oriented and uh, get them out to their assignments. So to finish off, what are our... Uh, challenges. Our challenges are recruitment and retention, both for volunteer and career employees. And I believe one of the MACO initiatives this year is looking at uh, the fire service and recruitment and retention. Uh, and money is not always the motivator for this, and especially for volunteers. And I would suggest that the, what the legislature decides or the summer study group will hopefully get us some answers to where we are. 
Our other challenge is we're competing in the region. When I say the region, um, Carroll County residents definitely in commuting distance to places like Fairfax and Loudoun and even Prince William counties, and uh, they're very competitive. We're beyond competitive with what we can offer sometimes, as are the local Baltimore jurisdictions of Baltimore County, Howard, Anne Arundel, um, and then we'll add Frederick into the metropolitan Washington along with Prince George's and Montgomery. So we have a lot of competition, but Carroll offers some unique things, particularly our uh, eight-day-a-month schedule with a 2472. Uh, the public safety system, we all recognize that that's a beginning point, and given some time, uh, the system will change and there will be other incentives and it gives people an opportunity uh, to come and get on the ground floor of a system. It also gives an opportunity for those who may have retired from another system and quite a few of our lieutenant hiring are going to be people that have already had careers which brings that experience and the best practices of other jurisdictions into Carroll to help to create what the uh, the Carroll way is going to be and we're not here to recreate any other department uh, we're here to create our own way our own culture that will consist of both career and volunteers um, we have to maintain and support the volunteer system and uh, we're probably I would say the top of all governmental support for any of the volunteer systems that exist throughout the state. And so uh, Carroll County does a very good job of assuring that the volunteers have the resources that they need and hopefully we will continue to do that and maybe make some enhancements. Uh, we're going to be defining our service delivery model. Um, fire departments are doing more and more with less and less and we have to define what are our priorities. Uh, some of the things going forward that we may want to look at with EMS, alternative destinations for transports, taking people to the um, outpatient facilities versus emergency rooms, looking at our large nursing home uh, population that we have here and a patient at 11 o'clock at night that just got lab values that were done at 8 in the morning may not be an emergency and if we have other calls pending we may want to look how we can put these people into a queuing system and they'll still get help but they may not be a high acuity patient so we got to look at some other alternatives and certainly our community paramedicine will do that uh, relevant standards laws and regulations are going to keep our uh, feet to the fire, uh, if you will, because we have to keep up with technology, we have to keep up with annual compliance mandates, and our learning management system that we were enabled to buy, we're bringing that online now, which will take care of a lot of that. Uh, training and development will be ongoing. Uh, we got a great facility, and uh, hopefully we'll be getting our phase two done, but we're going to need to start staffing our training and development section. Uh, we have one officer in charge of that uh, with the volunteers and the number of career people. We're looking at about 1,100 people, and right now we get a lot of that done through the University of Maryland, which will continue, but we're going to have to have more of a training presence uh, just so we can manage particularly the compliance. And infrastructure growth and development. Uh, we have some things that we're looking at, particularly with uh, EMS billing. The other big area is data analytics. Uh, we've got to link what's being done individually still into a single silo. We've got to join into the statewide reporting system uh, because as we pursue future grants through uh, Homeland Security funding, the uh, assistance to firefighter grants, SAFE or what have you, one of the requirements is our data reporting has to be centralized and synchronized with the state, which is handled by the state police fire marshal, and currently we're not doing that. So we have a lot of challenges, and it's going to take some infrastructure, and we will get there. So questions? <laughs> 14 minutes and 30 seconds. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to make okay. it over 15. But um, <laughs> no, uh, one of the things I didn't even realize happened, and – people talk to me about it this winter <sighs> they do non-transport calls 
where they're called to a house and there's no intention of taking anybody to the hospital they Correct. perform a service how, how many of those happen and or is that something you're going to be able to keep doing uh, um, yes we'll be able to keep doing that and part part of that is do we need to send an ambulance or is a piece of fire apparatus uh, better where I came from we changed that dynamic because our uh, EMS units are constantly on the street and the question will be is what does that call require uh, the other thing is you bring up a good point we're looking moving forward and the uh, funding people at the federal level are looking that currently refusals where we go and we evaluate somebody and they decide now we don't want to go to the hospital we can actually bill for those so when we take over the billing we'll be able to send a bill and uh, most insurance and medicare and medicare we can recover a certain amount of fund money from that so we're going to be looking at that and uh, the, the service calls, you know, the, the analogy for the fire and EMS service is when nobody else will come, you dial 911 and we're going to come and we will try to make the best of the situation and handle whatever it is that we can handle. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, that's part of our tradition of service and we'll continue to do that. Um, some of these responses that we go to it as you mentioned we help someone back in bed uh, we go to those we remain in service so if a higher level call were to come out in that process obviously we're not going to put the person back on the ground but you know we work around that and we can free ourselves up uh, pretty quickly so i think there's still a need for us to do that because um, the people literally have no one to, to take care of them. And anybody that has a parent that you've dealt with into old age, um, you can understand that. And to me, that's part of the community service. That's part of identifying who we are. And on both sides, the career and the volunteer, we have no qualms about continuing doing those types of things. And, and then the, the, I call it hybrid, you, you called it something else, but the, the whole hybrid system, you've got so many challenges as it moves forward. And I haven't looked at the MOUs, but you're gonna have county owned vehicles and county employees in a corporation's building. Yes. Stored at night, which has to be some insurance issues and some Yes, and what we, what we did in preparation for that, and along with risk management, and along with the law office and the budget office, is we brought in and we studied the issue, and there are probably about four or five national insurance companies. One that we have is part of AIG, so it's an international corporation, and they developed an insurance policy specific to what we do, and they've done other county jurisdictions. So there's a lot of questions, but everyone is now covered uh, under the liability policies, um, workers' comps taken care of on both sides, and had we not been able to work those issues out, it would be difficult to operate. But um, we're pretty confident in fact uh, the insurer that we have just began we're going to be doing joint inspections annually of all the facilities along with a representative from the corporation our safety person and them and we did two of our stations last week it was very successful yeah, so. so we in the county insure the county pays for and insures yes. all mm -hmm. the vehicles all the buildings and the workman's comp version of all the people any other uh, questions yeah, thanks Comment? Thanks, sir. I appreciate it, Chief. Um, okay. Commissioner Vigliotti, I don't see you, but... Can you drop the... I, I am all good, but thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. I'm not sure what he said. I didn't hear. Can you drop the slides? Good. He said he was good, I would imagine. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And we can see him. Okay, fantastic. Are. I think that is it for uh, this afternoon. Um, two really quick things I want to say. One, before you leave, there are some zoning annexation maps. Yep, we have three maps to sign in blue ink. And then secondly, the transportation letter was on the agenda for next week or the week after. It's actually not the letter. It's, um, it's the uh, talking about what the board wants oh, to Oh, okay, yeah. good. So yeah, it's yeah, about I, the letter, just, information yeah. about the letter in general. That, that's great. I just want to make sure that we input collectively yep. knew what this was before a letter came to us because yeah. no. it's... It's about what you want in the letter. Got it. What the um, is and what you want. Okay. I'm done. Um, is there anything else for the good of the group? I need a motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. I got a motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There you go, Joe. We are adjourned. <laughs>